Well, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to present a paper on Thomas Aquinas. And because you don't joke with Thomas Aquinas, I'm going to read it. Be ca carefully parsing every word you know? <laughs> and not playing with words and not joking with it. Uh, the title is, Did Thomas Aquinas Teach Justification by Faith? Question mark. And if one thinks of Thomas Aquinas, the immediate associations that emerge in pronouncing his name go as far as including topics such faith and reason, maybe, Aristotle and Christianity, virtues and vices in the context of Christian morality. Justification by faith as such does not seem to be the doctrine that is most known for in centuries of Thomistic studies, nor does it belong to the core of his theology, whatever that is. It is also true that since the Reformation, especially since Martin Luther, Thomas has become the champion of an account of the doctrine of justification that seems to run contrary to the Protestant rendering. Thomas's view of justification has been pitted against that of the Reformation as representing two opposite and mutually exclusive interpretations. The reality is that while this oppositional view may match the classical Protestant Reformation versus the Council of Trent, Thomas's doctrine should be seen more as an instance of medieval discussions than one of post-Reformation controversies. So after locating it in its medieval theological context and seeing it as belonging to the broadly defined Augustinian tradition, with some not insignificant modifications, of course, the paper will assess it uh, as uh, stemming from two main works where Thomas deals with it extensively, namely his commentary on Romans with a more exegetical thrust, and then in, in the specific questio dedicated to it in the Summa, with a more scholastic, systematic flavor. This dual exercise will expose to what Thomas meant when referring to justification, both in terms of his biblical interpretation and comprehensive theological framework. So the medieval background. In approaching Thomas and the doctrine of justification by faith, one must bear in mind that his understanding of justification was not shaped around the questions of the 16th century, but against the background of the late medieval discussions on grace, sin, and salvation in the context of different voices debating the significance of the Augustinian tradition. Throughout the Middle Ages, Augustine was considered to be the primary reference point on all kinds of theological issues, and justification was no exception. Against the background of the controversy against Pelagius and the Pelagians, Augustine had developed his theology of justification by underlining the fact that God's grace is absolutely necessary for salvation. In the words of Stephen Duffy in Augustine's theology, quote, all is grace from initial conversion to final perseverance. Justification falls under the rubric of the primacy of God's grace in salvation, seen as a complete work of God to be received in faith and baptism. Only after justification can human nature be active in cooperative, cooperative grace. The other Augustinian emphasis is, that, is the fact that justification is viewed as a process moved by God who initiates a journey of transformation by infusing supernatural grace. Again, Duffy aptly summarizes Augustine's view when he argues that, I quote, grace accomplishes a real change in the human being, that is, rebirth, justification, adoption, divinization, 
and participation in, div in the divine life. Justification is just one part of uh, that composite view of the way in which God's grace is received. Although distinguished, justification is not thought of in forensic or declarative terms only, but in transformational or transformative ones too. All the steps in Augustine require God's grace to occur, but they do impress a change that initiates a process guided by grace and made possible by the infusion of divine grace resulting in a journey of justification. Of course, all of these terms are uh, buzzwords if we read them in post-Reformation language, and they would need to be you know, expounded and explained further. Both the event and the process are to be considered as part of justification. The Council of Orange in 529 solidified this Augustinian framework, giving it an imprimatur as far as the official teaching of the Western Church was concerned, and stabilizing the pillars of an anti-Pelagian approach. This does not mean that the Council of Orange covered all that was left open or undefined. While there was a broad agreement on what happens in justification, there remained great and growing disagreement on how and why it happened. The cooperative aspect of grace reiterated the transformative understanding of justification. Added to that, the Council underlined the sacramental dimension evoked by Augustine, that is baptism, and it further expanded it. The combination of these two elements became the window through which the subsequent medieval theology of justification would look at in looking at the issue. So the sacramental initiation uh, was reinforced in the interpretation of the Council of Orange. In late medieval theology, Year of San Victor does not even include a chapter on justification. Only a few decades later, Peter Lombard deals with justification in the context of his doctrine of the sacrament of penance. So the shift has now occurred from the locus of grace, so to speak, to a shared locus of grace and the sacraments be belonging to one another. That's a shift that has taken place in the Augustinian tradition. And Peter Lombard mirrors that shift, locating justification in the context of his doctrine, doctrine of the sacrament of penance and with the meaning of the remission of sins, therefore belonging to the fourth group of his fourth book of his sentences. It is important to notice that in the Middle Ages, the theological locus where justification is thought to be part of is sacramentology. That is the mechanism of grace or the way grace can be received by, via the reception of the sacraments. In this case, no longer baptism only, but baptism and penance too. So the first shift occurred between the primacy of grace into the co-primacy of grace and the sacraments, that is baptism, but then to that window, sacramental window, was also added the sacrament of penance. So that's another development in the Augustinian tradition. Grace could be received via the reception of the sacraments, that is baptism and penance, coupled with a penitent heart on the part of the sinner. The Augustinian emphasis on divine grace was shifted towards the reception of the sacraments by which grace is enacted and the sacraments are administered by the church. That's the other further emphasis. Baptism, penance, the church administering the sacraments. <clears throat> 
the dispositions and motivations of the recipient also become of paramount importance, opening space for merit and rewards. And therefore, again, adding another layer in the Augustinian doctrine of justification that was implicit maybe, but becomes explicit, even central. The sacramental ecclesiastical system now, coupled with the subjective movements of the penitent, take precedence over the objective and finalized work of grace. Same tradition, at least nominally speaking, but with a significant uh, shift in its emphasis. In Michael Orton's words, forgiveness became the goal of the process of justification rather than its source. So, emphasis is taken away from the source, the objective nature of grace being received to the goal of the process uh, to be received by the reception of the sacraments administered by the church with a subjective attitude of the penitent. The breach left open by Augustine on the role of the sacraments and cooperative grace in receiving justification has now become a wide open door. While claiming to be Augustinian, the Middle Ages witnessed to a turning point in the way justification was theologized, still being under the same current of Augustinian tradition, but reinterpreting it and adding different elements and points. Looking at justification from a sacramental viewpoint is also what Thomas does. It is true for Thomas as well as for his eminent predecessor, Albert the Great. But it is only with Thomas, and this is something that belong, is to be accredited to him, it is only with Thomas that the doctrine of justification leaves the place assigned to it by Peter Lombard as a subtopic under penance, penance and becomes a locus in and of itself within or at the heart of his discussion on grace. So Thomas re-push the pendulum away from this uh, sacramental emphasis, although he retains it, back to the discussion on grace. As already seen in the Augustinian tradition, the nature of justification consists in a real moral and ontological change in the individual. A literal understanding of the Latin term justificare entailed an account of the sinner being made righteous in the process of justification. A firm distinction between justification and sanctification remained unknown to the medieval theologians. What the Middle Ages are interested in is the exploration of the significance of the process of justification, processus justificationis. Augustine had distinguished three aspects of justification, the washing of regeneration by which sins are forgiven confession of sins by which guilt is removed, prayer of forgiveness by which sin is pardoned. The, this Augustinian threefold scheme was largely considered as normative, although it increasingly lost its specific reference to the biblical framework of justification to the point of being exceedingly blurred with regeneration and conversion. It is not a surprise to see it rephrased has to be referred to, instead of three steps in the process, uh, into a fourfold process, including the infusion of, first, of the first grace, the contrition of the heart, the remission of sin, and the reward of merits. That's the fourth step. Together with the increase of the theological confusion around the meaning of justification, in the Middle Ages, another step was added, thus making it a fourfold scheme. And so, merits and rewards were added to the process. 
that now has become a fourfold process and no longer a threefold, but still maintaining the view of a process characterized uh, with an emphasis on the sacraments, pen penance, and the church administering the sacraments. So, after surveying the medieval discussions, we're now in a better place to come to terms with Thomas's view on justification. To approach them properly, the semi-Augustinian framework should be recognized. In commenting on Philippians 2, 9 to 13, so it's another comment not on Romans, but on Philippians, Thomas argues that Paul excludes four false opinions. The first one is the opinion of those who believe that man can be saved by his own free will, without God's help. Against this, Paul says, for God is at work in you, both to will and to work. So Thomas rejects the view that we are saved by our own free will, without God's help. The second error to be avoided is of those who deny free will altogether and say that man is necessitated either by fate or by divine providence. He, ex he excludes this when referring to Paul in saying, God is at work in you. So he moves the will from within to act as well. That takes Thomas to argue that we're not saved by our own free will, but we are ni neither are we saved by denying free will. The third error that uh, Thomas wants to stay away, like the first, is that of the Pelagians, who say that choices are in us, but the performing of works lies in God. Because willing comes from us, but accomplishing comes from God. And again, Thomas rejects this view in pointing to the fact that Paul says, God works both to will and to work. So, not just one of the two. The fourth error is the opinion that God accomplishes every good in us, and does this through our merits. He excludes this, Thomas excludes this, by making reference to what Paul says, that God does these things for his good pleasure and not our merits. So this is the framework that allows Thomas to approach uh, his commentary on justification in reading the letter to the Romans. In terms of the relationship between divine agency and human free will, Thomas excludes both Pelagianized accounts and views that are absolutely absolute driven by divine providence, which unfortunately here are associated with fatalism, that is an impersonal pagan form of denying any recognition to human responsibility. For Thomas, divine and human agencies are not to be seen in competition. In this sense, while adhering to the Augustinian affirmation of the primacy of grace, Thomas interprets it as softening the radical effects of sin on the mind and the will. A fuller treatment of the doctrine of justification, at least from the exegetical point of view or the medieval exegetical point of view is to be found in his commentary on Romans. This commentary belongs to the second Parisian sojourn and was completed around the same time of the dedicated section of the Summa, which expounds justification in a more scholastic and systematic way. According to Thomas, Romans explores grace as it is in itself. An important element in Thomas's account of justification is the use of participatory categories in expounding the relationship between Christ 
who is the Son of God by nature, and us who are sons of God in an adoptive sense. The participation of the justified is in the latter sense, but nonetheless thought of in these participatory terms. Paul's statement that there is no one righteous is understood to mean, as to mean that no one, I quote Thomas, no one is just within himself and on himself, but of himself everyone is a sinner, end of quote. The presence of sin is not as corruptive as one could, ima could imagine. While recognized, Thomas says, everyone has, I quote, some sin, and this condition does not equal with the late, later Protestant accounts of total depravity caused by sin. The principal effect of sin, according to Thomas, is on the higher soul, the mind, that loses control over the lower soul that governs the body and one's own passions. After the mind is turned away from God by sin, man lost control of the lower powers. Grace is then a gift given by which man, a gift that was lost at creation and at, uh, with, with, with the entrance of sin, but is now reinfused with justification in order to be reestablished. There is no sense of justification meaning imputation of Christ's righteousness. Even when Thomas deals with Romans chapter 4 and the story of Abraham, and he, he deals with the language of reckoning, justification is primarily seen as a complete cleansing. So a process leading to a complete cleansing. As for the nature of justifying faith, here is what uh, Horton, the way in which Michael Horton summarizes uh, Thomas's reading of Romans. Faith justifies because it is an inherent virtue caused by the infusion of grace. So there is the recognition of sin, there is the recognition that grace is infused as a gift, super additum, given uh, by God, infused at baptism, and causing the beginning of a journey, of a process, and inherently transforming uh, the sinner into someone who participates in the nature of, in divine nature, as in an adoptive sense. Faith justifies not because it embraces Christ's alien righteousness as one's own, but because it is the beginning of sanctification. And Thomas reiterates this view whereby justification and sanctification as are seen along an ongoing process, along the same spectrum, distinguished from the uh, language point of view, the vocabulary in vocabulary, but not distinguished in their theological uh, proprieties. The categories of the Reformation, that is, imputation, alien righteousness, cannot be found in Thomas, nor can they be projected backwards. Thomas simply does not have them in their forensic and covenantal meaning. It's still part of the tradition whereby justification is the beginning of a process initiated by baptism, leading to, through penance and the sacraments to the rewards. Uh, Opt, opt for at the end. Thomas hints to aspects of uh, a forensic language or interpretation of justification in Paul according to the Romans, but he puts them in a transformative journey. Justification is a process of becoming holy through infused grace and that grace-inspired merits are means to that hand. While the first grace of justification is not merited even by faith, in order to, br to bring complete justification, that is, sanctification, faith must become love 
and meritorious works. To summarize, in the commentary to the Romans, justification is a movement of the sinner from a state of interior injustice, known as sin, to a state of interior justice that expels such sin, caused instantaneously when the grace of God is infused and causes the sinner to accept grace by her or his free will and freely despise sin and turn from loving it towards God and loving God. The justice brought about by this grace in the interior of the human soul is such that the human intellect or reason is directed towards God. And when the, the intellect is directed towards God, the lower faculties follow. Justification is by faith because faith has a structural priority over charity. But because the intellect has a structural priority over the will, then it is translated into the, a movement of the will and therefore a process of acting lovingly. Though justification is brought about by faith and is the sinner's first movement toward God, it especially consists in charity because justice is infused and transforms, therefore the sinner leading to works of charity. That's a summary of uh, Thomas's treatment of justification as he wrestled with the letter to the Romans. With carry on, medieval discussions, placing himself in the same tradition, introducing elements that uh, highlight some of the biblical insights coming from the letter to the Romans, but basically uh, restating that Augustinian <clears throat> inter medieval interpretation of the doctrine. The issue regarding the justification of the sinner is dealt with in, in the Summa, uh, the, uh, the first part of the second part, especially on, in question 113, written close to the same time close to the same time as the commentary on Romans and in the context of the exposition of the doctrine of grace. So these two texts are very close to one another chronologically and they are different in terms of their focus. One is more a commentary on the biblical text. The second is more of a part of a treatment, a scholastic treatment uh, of the doctrine of justification in the context of his treatment of grace. In this section, we find some themes already dealt with in the commentary on Romans, but with an even more pronounced scholastic argumentative structure. According to Otto Pesch, a Catholic scholar of Thomas, this section of the Summa is, quote, replete with Aristotelian concepts Yet its outcomes reflect the purest Augustinian spirit. While certainly there, the association with Augustine's view of justification seems overstated. Thomas is closer to the medieval readings of Augustine with their blurred line on the divine free will agency, divine agency free will relationship, and their more pronounced emphasis on the sacramental mechanism of grace than to Augustine himself. Certainly is part of the Augustinian tradition, but to what extent is in direct line with Augustine himself, that's a matter to be debated. Thomas's is an interpretation of Augustine which contains some resemblances to him and some points of departure from him. The overlapping between Thomas and Augustine on justification is simply a too simplistic reading 
all the two fathers. What is most, most impressive is Thomas's reliance on Aristotle's physics in his account of justification. It is the infusion of grace that moves the mind and the will towards God and away from sin, leading to forgiveness. This idea of movement is now reconceptualized against the background of an Aristotelian physics. It was already there prior to Thomas as part of a process, processus, processus, but now is rethought of in terms of another framework characterized by Aristotelian physics. The terms are there, the words are the same, but the conceptual framework is now derived from Aristotelian physics. In a nutshell, here is how Thomas summarizes his view of justification. And this is uh, a quotation. The justification of the sinner, sorry, the justification of the ungodly is a certain movement, motus. So that's the, the other word, processus becomes motus. And motus is related to the mover. Is the movement, the motus, whereby the human mind is moved by God, the prime mover, from the state of sin to the state of justice. It would be interested, interesting to pause for a moment on each of the important terms that he uses here. Justification, the ungodly, movement, motus, impacting the human mind and moving it from the state of sin to the state of justice. In this definition, we find the characteristic features of Thomas's view. The understanding of justification as motus, the primacy of the mind, the role of grace as elevating and healing the disorder in the soul, and the transition from the state of sin to the one of justice. Thomas gives voice to a kind of intellectualist understanding of human nature, whereby if the higher nature, that is the mind, is subject to God, then the lower nature, that is the will, affections, etc., will be governed by it. In his view of the impact of original sin, Thomas is convinced that it affected less the mind than the will. The mind is surrounded by a kind of firewall that protects it. Grace is substantial in God, whereas is accidental in us who receive it as creatures and who participate in it. We've now reached question 113, where Thomas deals with the effects of grace with special reference to justification. Against the background of Aristotle's physics, Thomas sees justification, again, as a movement, a motus, from injustice to justice, involving a process. His understanding of justification as a process, transmutation, of becoming righteous from a state of unrighteousness. It is true that justification is through faith. However, that movement of faith is not perfect unless it is quickened by charity. So there is this ongoing movement of the primacy of grace received by faith leading to charity, that charity then moving backwards in order for faith to then be enacted in such a way that the process always revolves around different elements play, being at play here. Hence, in the justification of the ungodly, a movement of charity is infused together with the movement of faith. So faith, charity, faith comes first, but it can never come on its own. And then charity then re-nurtures faith in order 
for the whole process to be then a process of ongoing transformation. The movement is brought about by four steps. So Thomas uh, agrees with the fourfold movement accounted for in the Middle Ages. The infusion of grace as the first one, the movement of the, of the will toward God, the movement of the will away from sin, the remission of sin as the final step. In Michael Horton's helpful summary, in Thomas, there are two types of grace, operating and cooperating, echoing the Augustinian language. There are two types of grace. The first comes from God, the second involving our cooperating with it. Five effects of grace, healing of the soul, movement of the will to the good, resulting in good acts, in perseverance and attaining glory, and four requirements of justification, that is infusion of grace, faith, repentance, and forgiveness. So it's a very a rather complicated picture whereby we have to deal with different types of grace resulting in different effects and being then uh, actualized by four requirements. All this complexity needs to be taken into consideration. So it is easy when approaching Thomas just to focus on one aspect and forgetting other aspects that are equally important and then to concentrate on one side and losing sight of the whole. It is in Questio, Questio 114 that Thomas concentrates on the issue of merit here again, there is a difference between what he had written in, 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 the, in his commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences and what he then writes in the Summa. We're not going into you know, the complex discussion about the merits, de condigno or de congruo. He has a whole section on it. Maybe in the discussion time we can jump on this uh, interesting uh, treatment. Conclusions. While coming close to certain aspects of a forensic doctrine of justification, especially when dealing with the language of Romans 4 concerning reckoning, the language of reckoning, it is Aristotle's view of motion that seems to be paramount in Thomas's accounting for what happens at justification. He is not completely out of touch of reckoning and the legal forensic language of the Bible, but the main category that is fo uh, following is that of motus. And motus is not a legal term, is a transformative, is a motion, is a movement. It belongs to a different metaphor not coming from the court, but belonging to space. While there is some propensity to consider the legal interpretation of the Greek verb dikaio, it is the transformative interpretation leading to a movement of the Latin justificare interpreted according to Aristotelian categories that prevails. According to Thomas, justification is a gift that can be increased by cooperation with no assurance of the end results. Justification is the beginning of a process involving a whole movement of the mind first, the will second, resulting in charity, refuel, refueling the process of justification and therefore hopefully leading to rewards. Thomas's reading of justification starts with an Augustinian foundation in the basic terminology, albeit revised in terms of the medieval uh, 
semi-Augustinian appropriation, appropriations of Augustine, and then adds biblical contents, especially derived by the letter to the Romans, and then is significantly driven by Aristotelian categories and couched in medieval accounts of salvation, marked by baptismal regeneration, justification by infusion, acts of penance, and indulgences. So there is an Augustinian background reinterpreted by Middle Ages uh, accounts of Augustine. There are biblical elements and in the framework of a uh, Aristotelian physics leading to this complex account of justification. Horton is again helpful in providing a careful interpretation of the overall trajectory. I quote him, justification for Thomas Aquinas includes forgiveness and renewal. It is both an event, the first justification, and a process, a motion, sanctification. In other words, justification is an all-inclusive term for salvation. This is the reason why we can end this paper by quoting Francis Beckwith when he writes, after surveying Thomas's doctrine of justification, he argues that, and I quote, it is abundantly clear that Aquinas was more a proto-Tridentine Catholic than a proto-Protestant. Thank you.